I seem to remember doing this in a movie somewhere. Hello and welcome to Denver Public Library Saturday Matinee. My name is Daria and together with our co-host Andrew, we are supporting today's discussion of Jacques Denis' vibrant and melodic masterpiece, Les Parapluies de Cherbourg, or The Umbrellas of Cherbourg. As always, use the chat for all your awesome questions and comments and we'll look at those in the last 15 to 20 minutes. As far as that discussion goes, keep in mind that we're here to talk about this film and their related works especially the French New Wave Cinema. So please keep your question focused on that and be excellent to each other. December 19th talk with Alison Anders on Shoot the Piano Player had been uploaded to Denver Public Library's YouTube channel and the film and the book list had been sent out. So the list of recommended titles today will also be sent out after this concludes. You don't have to take notes. You can just sit back and relax. If you're having trouble with the picture or the sound, Message myself or Andrew, we'll do our very best to help you out. And now in chat and on your cam, please give the warmest welcome to our wonderful panel today, film critic Walter Chow and director Ashlyn Clark. Uh, good morning, everybody. Yeah, thank you for so much for being here and sort of in honor of us rejoining the Paris Accord, we're doing this beautiful French film today, The Umbrellas of, of, of Cherbourg. Thank God to have adults in charge again, right? Not here today, but in general. I don't know that I was so grateful to watch a press conference in my life, um, but we're not here to talk about that. We've talked in the last few weeks, uh, last few months, about the French New Wave often. We, we, we've done a couple of great films, including Agnes Varda's Cleo from Five to Seven and Shoot the Piano Player with, uh, with Alison Anders a few weeks ago. Uh, so very briefly, very broadly, the French New Wave was born essentially from a group of film critics that were born mostly in the 1930s. They started a film magazine called Cahir du Cinema, uh, the chief editor, Andre Bazin, and a bunch of uh, young ruffians, young rebellious punks and film critics and scholars who were raised on the movies that they saw after uh, the end of World War II that the United States had sent over a lot of genre films, things that were sort of devalued, I think, in the American conversation, cultural conversation, uh, maybe to this day. But uh, they, they, they saw things in them. They began to see a moving, a motivating force in these films, and they referred to that force as an auteur, an author in each one of these films. It could have been an actor, most often it was a director, production designer, even, or cinematographer, but there was something that was uh, constant. It was an artist behind all of these things. Uh, they rediscovered for the American audience movies by John Ford, by Anthony Mann, by Alfred Hitchcock. They started writing about it very seriously. And then at some point in the late fifties, they began to make their own movies. And uh, they, they took the camera out of the studio. They walked around the streets they, they, uh, of Paris and Montmartre and, Cherbourg and all, and they, they, they shot people, they shot everyday life, they, 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 they captured these rhythms and they criticized through their films, American genre conventions, the gangster movies, romances in the musical, as we'll talk about today. They understood movies in a very sort of uh, um, instinctual sense. They were brought up on it as, as we all were. They were the first generation like the movie Brats in America in the 1970s, uh, the German new wave even, which began in 1962, right after the French new wave. They were brought up on film and they understood it in a, in a really interesting, quintessentially postmodern way. Some of the directors uh, that came out of the Cahir du Cinema, Jean-Luc Godard, Francois Truffaut, Eric Romer, Jacques Rivette, Claude Chabrol, and right alongside them was another school of, of filmmakers in France, the left bank, they were called. They weren't really antagonistic towards each other. They sort of overlapped uh, uh, now and then. We have a cameo by Jean-Luc Godard and Cleo from 5 to 7, the, 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 Var, the Varda film. But the left bank community included a more maybe traditionally minded in many ways in terms of theme, if not approach, uh, uh, directors like Alain Rizne, Agnes Varda, Chris Marker, and Jacques Demy, the guy we're talking about today. Um, the other thing I wanna give sort of a quick background on today before we introduce our, our amazing guest um, is the Algerian war that France found, found themselves embroiled in from 1954 to 1962. Um, they had annexed, they had colonized Algeria in the early part of the 19th century, about 1832, 34, something like that. Um, a, a largely Muslim country, I think 2 million Muslims uh, in France, uh, um, in, in Algeria at that time. 
and, and they wanted to be free of colonization, which seems eminently reasonable. Uh, a, a revolution began, a civil war in 1954 to push out the French. And our hero, Guy, of Umbrellas of Cherbourg goes off to fight for a couple of years in Algeria. The war ends in 1962 with uh, the United Nations recognizing unanimously, essentially, uh, Al Algeria as a sovereign nation. The impact and the uh, lingering echo of the Algerian war, I think, is under um, examined when we talk about the French New Wave and the things that pushed uh, these young filmmakers out into film as protest, film as a sort of social commentary and political movement. Um, a, 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 a French journalist from this period during the Algerian war uh, c condemned France for it. They, they said from now on, Frenchmen must know that they don't have the right to condemn in the same terms as 10 years ago, the destruction of Orador and the torture by the Gestapo. Uh, the, the French notoriously used torture as a means of uh, psychological and political warfare during the Algerian war. So the impact on the returning soldiers, the impact on all of these things has been sort of related to the return of soldiers from Vietnam in the, in, in the United States. Uh, something changed in French society. And so the French New Wave among all of the beautiful, wonderful, kinetic, compulsive things that they did uh, also became a means of real protest and social commentary and, and Umbrellas of Cherbourg, no less so often, so often unfairly, I think dismissed as a, be, uh, as a piece of um, fluff or piffle is actually uh, loaded with commentary about so social issues and capitalism and all of these things uh, and war trauma indeed war trauma. Um, very briefly, we'll talk about this more as, as we get into our talk. Uh, the great composer, Michel Legrand, uh, does the, the, the songs for this film based on lyrics by, by Jacques Demy. Um, he went on to score more than 200 films and, and TV shows. He won three Oscars for summer of 1942 uh, for Yentl and for the best song for, from Thomas Crown Affair. I don't actually remember that song. I'll have to spin it up later. Um, he also won five Emmys, I think, during the course of a long storied career. Um, and then finally, a quick introduction of Jacques Demy, uh, born in 1931, adjacent, as I said, to the French New Wave, a left bank filmmaker, uh, was married to Agnes Varda, uh, and he died in 1990 of AIDS-related complications. He was bisexual. Um, and uh, to the end, I, th I know that Varda in interviews has said that they, they try to encourage him. Uh, uh, his family to declare what it was, to talk about uh, AIDS, but he was sort of in denial and, and secretive about it to the end. I only bring it up because um, Sher Umbrellas of Sherbrooke talks about domesticity and society and is fairly critical, I think, in some respects of those things. Uh, and it's good to know a little bit about the filmmaker. I equate Jacques Demy in my mind to uh, Douglas Sirk, uh, the great uh, American uh, well, eventually American, uh, met, uh, director of melodramas. Um, all right. Finally, before I introduce our guest, uh, it, this, the first third of this movie especially reminds me of a lot of John Keats's letters that he wrote to Fanny Braun. As you know, John Keats died when he was 25 and he knew it. He was a medical student. He was sickly. Um, he knew the end was near, uh, but he wrote a series of really beautiful letters to uh, Fanny and here's a, a line from one of them. I'll try to get through it without, without breaking up. I have been astonished that men could die martyrs for religion. I've shuddered at it. I shudder no more. I could be martyred for my religion. Love is my religion. I could die for that. I could die for you. All right. So our guest today uh, is a film scholar, um, a, a teacher, a director. She directed two years ago, three years ago almost now, uh, an extraordinary film called The Devil's Doorway. It's a horror film, a found footage one shot in 16 millimeter that deals with the, mag the legacy of the Magdalene la Laundries in Ireland, uh, a, a really ugly history that's continuing to be uncovered. There seems to be a new story every uh, day about continued atrocities. Her father was a bread man who delivered uh, occasionally to some of these laundries. They're open recently in our history. We have people who are alive who are uh, victims of it. Um, and and he, 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 he remembered to her that, uh, you know, the young women, the Millies would open the door and they would be sweaty and red faced and their hands would be chapped. It was a vision of hell. And, um, and Ashlyn made this movie uh, that, that has supernatural elements, but really the, the real horror is 
the uh, uh, you know the continued oppression and abuse of women um, around the world. It's an extraordinary debut, one of the best horror debuts that I've ever seen. The debuts period that I've ever seen. I was very lucky uh, to uh, have seen it early a couple of years ago, and I reached out immediately to the publicists that were handling the film. I think IFC at that point had already gotten it. And I said, I have to talk to this director. I don't know who she is. I don't know that she's on anything else, but I'm going to do my research before I call her. But I need to talk to her because I want to catch this wave at the very beginning of it. Um, and indeed, uh, we, we did get to chat and we've been sort of friendly, hopefully. I, I feel friendly and warm towards her ever since. Um, she is a, a socially active, um, intellectually active, and a brilliant artist and creator. Uh, has worked in radio, has worked in television and documentaries and all of those things, and is currently teaching and finishing her PhD. So without further ado, uh, and this is her choice today, The Umbrellas of Cherbourg, I think a, a brilliant choice for any number of reasons. Um, without further ado, uh, Ashlyn Clark. Ashlyn, thank you for being here. Walter, what a gorgeous introduction. Thank you for that. And what a lovely way to introduce the film to, and that, Kate's breaking my heart. Oh, Beautiful. My Yes. Yeah. I, you know, I think of Bright Star now, whenever I think of, uh, of, of Keats, it just, uh, it's just, it's another film like Umbrellas of Cherbourg now that I can't watch any five minutes of without crying, which we should <laughs> talk about a little bit, you know, this, this will be my therapy today a little bit, but let's start with an easy question or a hard question. Why Umbrellas of Cherbourg when we first started talking about doing this together? Oh, uh, that's an interesting one. Well, um, first of all, this is one of my all time favorite movies. I absolutely love this film. It's, one of those when I first saw this that was one of those landmark moments when you really know that you actually absolutely love this medium um, it was a, a very memorable event it was uh, just before Christmas um, my film professor who I was very fond of and very close to unfortunately no longer with us um, Professor Sam Rohde got a print of the Umbrellas of Cherbourg I don't even know where he got it um, but it was a really a uh, special thing that he did for us. Only about five people showed up and he was disappointed in that, but at the same time, he didn't really care because I think mostly he just wanted to watch the print on the big screen himself. Um, we had the Queen's Film Theatre in which to watch it. It was snowing outside. Um, our Secretary of Film Studies, Patricia, was always singing this song. This was, she was always humming, um, I will wait for you. and. I recognized it instantly when I watched the film and the whole thing was just magical. I was so struck by how beautiful it was, how sad it was. Um, we had spent some time watching MGM musicals in the previous semester and I saw the obvious analogues. Um, I was all, also interested in Nobel Vague in general at the time and it was that beautiful marriage, just the synchronicity of all that stuff at once. It was one of those moments you never forget when you think I really love movies. It's one of those movies for me that every time I watch it, depending on where I am in my life, it says something completely different for me. I pick a different character, it seems like each time to re re relate to. I know in about 15 or 20 years when I watch this again, I'll relate very much with the aunt who's lying in bed, you know, about to die. There seems to be a character for everyone in this film this time through. I really related to the mother, whereas before I always saw, saw her sort of as villainous, but now I have a daughter who's 15 years old. Um, and I saw it differently. And, you know, the, the, the loss of innocence, the loss of those things, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why this movie makes people cry at different times in their lives. I think the, well, for me personally, and I'll talk about this in a more general sense, how it affects other people, but um, I was, I had my son, as you know, Walter, when I was 17 years old, so I could see a bit of myself in this character. Uh, I saw this first, I was about 20 years old. And um, my boyfriend had just been, his job had just taken him to live in France permanently. So it was like, this was very real for me in a lot of different ways at that time, because I was facing that, am I ever going to see you again kind of uh, moment. But I think it resonates with people because it does, it does what French films so often do really well. And that is, it's not afraid to get its hands dirty in the, uh, reality, the gritty, sometimes horrible, sometimes beautiful reality of people's real human emotions. It's while it's simultaneously very colorful and it's a musical, um, really it's more an opera than a musical, but it's beautiful. With Catherine Deneuve, she's gorgeous. Everybody looks fantastic. It has that almost the sheen 
of singing in the rain or a big MGM musical, but it's peeling at the edges. The truth is there just underneath. It's the clash between romance and the, the quieter, softer reality of um, domesticity, marriage, love as it is lived in real life that everyone pretty much comes to face at some point in their lives. And there's something heartbreaking about that loss of innocence that's very human. And whereas American films very often, especially then, especially the big musicals tend to, the whole point is to gloss over, to escape, to present this glossy, shiny, colorful, beautiful, pretend thing where war doesn't traumatize people, where love lasts forever. But this film doesn't do that. This is, this is a real story. This could have really happened. Take away the songs and the colors. This is, this is a true story of real people. I think that's why it resonates. There's, and he tells this true story in so many extraordinary ways, so many extraordinary strategies that he employs. He painted um, buildings and, and streets to, to match and, and he lit them, uh, you know, and it'd be really, it re reminds me of Blow Up or in an Antonioni film who would later do a lot of the same things, right? He would paint entire buildings and city blocks to red or blue or, or whatever. And then the muted colors in the third part, when you, the, the first shot that we get during the third, the, the, re, 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 the return are washed out and drab and, and he wears yellow now. He doesn't wear blue and pink until the very end again. And there's, um, so many ways that you talk about the first bloom, you know, when the, the uh, Spike Lee dolly shot, right? When they're together and talking about, I'll wait for you and I'm going, I'll, I'll never forget you. I can never love another. They're floating literally down the alleyway. Um, the, the, the film in, 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 a, in a literal sense, I think is, is expressionistic. It expresses the interiors of these performers. And you've talked a lot in, in interviews with you about how closely related for you film is to dream. Can you talk a little bit about the form of umbrellas and sh of shareboard and the, the strategy of umbrellas of shareboard, shooting it this way, lighting it this way? I think that's a, a really interesting way to look at it, like a dream. Um, I think it's, it, it, is, it is like a dream, but it's a very conscious dream, if that makes sense. I think Jacques Demy is consciously um, linking this film to, he's making, there's a, you spoke earlier on about uh, the critique the French cinema makes of American culture and so on. But I think the overwhelming thing for me in so many of the Nouvelle Vague films and this one in particular is the deep affection that French uh, filmmakers and the French culture in general actually has with American pop culture. It's the desire for that to be real, for that dream to be a real thing, but the terrible acknowledgement because it's a waking dream that, it, that it's not real, that it's a fantasy. Um, I think that is where the beauty of these films lies. And I see this, uh, maybe it's because I'm between the two things. I'm in Ireland, so I'm not in France and I'm not in America, but I can see how both cultures really admire each other, but never quite meet in the middle. There, there's a clash, but there's a mutual affection between French culture and American culture. I don't know if you see it like that, but for me, that's, I've always been struck by that. And I think that is a, there's a deep thread of that in Umbrellas of Cherbourg. And in, um, in even the fact that uh, Guy is called Guy, Guy, you know, the American word for, for man. Um, he's, he, he is almost an all American boy at the start. He works in a gas or a, like a mechanic shop. He wants to open a gas station. Um, he's gonna be, he's gonna go off to war, but these are all very American tropes of that time. That you would see in uh, in American films, and whereas Genevieve is French, that's a classical French name. It's almost a romance between French and American culture. in In a certain viewing, you can take it like that. It's very Henry James in that sense. I ne never thought of that, and you know, I, I I've thought about the friendship between the French and the Americans only through a filter or an intermediary of like British romanticism, for instance, the idea that, you know, the French were inspired to have their own revolution because of the American revolution. And, 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 and you know, the Statue of Liberty, of course, being a gift from France and, and those things. But it's always been sort of theoretical for me because whenever I watch the new wave and I watch Breathless or I watch something like that, I, I feel like more, more of a critique because I think I'm very critical of our culture. 
uh, you know, and, and, and when, when I see them doing that, I feel more of an exasperation from these filmmakers saying, how, how do you not know that this yeah. is, how do you not know that this is your contribution? Yes, I think you're absolutely right about that. I think it's a complex relationship. Um, I think when it comes to stuff like American cool, musicals, pop culture, music, fashion, uh, the, there is a, the French love a lot of elements of that, but when you're talking about socio-political, uh, there's a there's a landscape, there's a much greater sense of uh, critique. But I think it's interesting that, um, I mean, Truffaut valued Hitchcock more than the American film establishment did at the time that Hitchcock was making movies. There's a there's always been a kind of simpatico, but uh, it's it's not a, a blind love either. They're very aware of the cultural issues, the uh, political issues, the social problems, and I think that's reflected in the work as well. But um, it's like every love story; it's complicated. Yeah, yeah, and and I I I think that Jacques Demy has been sort of unfairly relegated to sort of a secondary status among uh, uh, new wave filmmakers or French filmmakers uh, generally, because his movies are easy to dismiss. This one and The Young Girls of Roquefort, which I also adore, Jean Kelly and, uh, um, and Catherine Deneuve again, as, long, uh, as well as her sister. Um, but but they're, they're really beautiful to look at, visually stunning and easy to sort of dismiss as just a pretty face, I think. But to me, you know, his first film is Lola, which is really, really extraordinary, beautiful film, you know, dedicated to Max Ophuls, uh, Bay of Angels, and then Umbrellas of Cherbourg. But then he did, you know, stuff like, uh, what, what, you know, Donkey Skin. I mean, he did really model shop. He did very interesting, dark, I, I would argue, movies. Yeah. Uh, Un, Un Chambre in Ville, I think maybe is his late masterpiece, a, 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 you know, Room in the Town, which is very actually dark, just bleak. Um, and, 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 but, but, but Demi is always relegated to this sort of secondary status where in reality, even in Umbrellas of Cherbourg, universally remembered, I think is a very light film. There's a very dark cast of, you know, a conversation to, to, for starters of capitalism, a, a, a harsh critique of it. Can you talk a little bit about how those social issues begin to hit you now, um, you know, as out, out of school, as a, you know, as, as a grown person? I think, yeah, and as you say, every time I watch this film, I take something else from it every time. And it always breaks my heart, no matter who I'm identifying with in the film or new things I'm noticing, it always breaks my heart. And upon this watch, I was thinking about um, Guy's character and he comes back from war and I'm thinking about how we didn't see what happened to him. We know that he didn't write to her for two months. He wrote her one letter in two months, maybe. And um, he came back and I feel like he's got PTSD. He's not the same person who went away. He's come back with an alcohol problem. Um, he's come back tainted and sad. And we don't know what happened. We weren't shown that uh, perspective on it. And I think a lot of people, and it's one of the reasons why Jacques Demay gets written off because this is probably his most famous film and because it is such a, a, an explosion of confectionery on a first glance, that's how people see it. But actually this film is so nuanced and deep and so tragically human that I think that doesn't do uh, justice to what the film actually really is. Even if we take the main theme, the I will wait for you, um, and that's been covered a lot of times uh, Connie Francis did a big version of it that was big hit. Always really nice versions. We just saw Miss Piggies at the start of this <laughs> talk today. Um, a lot of really nice versions of a beautiful song, but none of them are as affecting as the version in the film. Because in the film, it is not a stand my ground ballad. It is the moment of greatest weakness that this character has. It's total desperation. When Catherine Deneuve is sitting in that bar with Guy and he's about to leave and get in the train she's in, in contrast to what you would see in an American film of the time she's not pretty crying Catherine Deneuve can't ugly cry she's too gorgeous but if she was not as beautiful as Catherine Deneuve it's the kind of crying that we call ugly crying her face is red she's sniffing it's real real vulnerable uh, 
emotional breakdown at that moment. And I think it's that misunderstanding, seeing that emotional thread and interpreting it as something that it isn't, when really it's about the raw kernel of humanity. And um, I think that's why every time you watch it, every time I watch it, we find something else in one of the other characters. Uh, it's really truthful, while at the same time being so uh, such a spectacle of colour and song, but it's really raw and truthful. When I watch it now, you know, and that this is a uh, um, testament, I think, to how 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 elderly I've become. I don't see her, a uh, 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 Catherine Nerve, as an object of desire anymore. I see her as a precious object, like a, a very young, a, a child in, in the first third, especially. I feel I, I, heartbroken for her, and, and you know the um, the the depth of her emotion. I feel like the mother says, "Look, you'll forget about him. The world is full of." men the world is full of others you'll meet you'll, you'll grow but when you're 20 or 17 you don't believe that's true i remember high school you know too well um every drama is the drama every emotion is the first time everyone has felt this emotion and he the the way that he expresses those things in the first third of it and the way that he pays those off in the last third of it for me is really quite extraordinarily wise you know it seems like an old person making this film although he was not terribly he was in his 30s when he made this movie um but there, there's such a wisdom of experience and 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 um in this movie and in 1964 two years after the end of the uh, algerian war i think people would have been more attuned in france perhaps to what the trauma is if not literally then then col collectively when guy returns he becomes an everyman for france at that moment of you know what they've lost during during that period of time, um, you know I I I love how the mother is very worried about losing her store, and I think it's it, it's during the pandemic become another key uh, contemporary concern. You know she can't keep her store open, she, yeah. and and at, at, at the end of it, uh, the umbrella store becomes a, a a store for washing machines. So, can you comment? Can we talk a little bit about? The sort of metamorphosis between the little boutique um, umbrella store into a uh, GE outlet. By yes. the end. I think it is a really interesting contrast. Um, the the umbrellas and then the washing machines, and obviously a very co a conscious decision to have it like that. I think the umbrellas. Um, I don't know how you feel about this, or but for me, I. The choice of the umbrellas is really interesting. Of course, there's a link to singing in the rain. Um, there's also umbrellas as a, a kind of a totem of protection to some extent. Um, the two kids at the start of the movie are every single thing, and I watched it last night with this in mind, every single thing that they do belies the fact that they've got absolutely no patience. Everything has to be now. So he leaves work. He's not going to stay late. No, I'm going to the theater tonight. He uh, goes down the street. She comes out of her work early just to get a quick snooch on the street corner. Everything has to be now. They can't wait. They go to the theater. Um, they go to a bar afterwards. They order lemonade. They don't even wait for it to wait for the lemonade to be given to them. They have to dance. Um, they walk in the rain. Uh, they don't. They don't have protection in a in a kind of literal sense because look what ends up happening. You know. Um, I think the umbrellas are a really interesting motif in that respect. And then uh, the washing machines. I mean, um, domesticity at its most banal, at its most, it's the, the drudgery of modern life. You know, it's, th this is what it's really like. This is not the gloss, the shine, the spinning umbrellas. Uh, in the musical, this is what happens when you get married. And do you know, I think in the same way that we spoke briefly about Brief Encounter, um, you and I before this, and I think as I've gotten older, when I was a younger person, more idealistic, when I was 19, 20, saw this movie, um, for me, the, it was the worst heartbreak. It was true love and they, were, they didn't get to be together. But I, I think my vision of what really is real love has changed a lot and um, I, I don't necessarily think that it's a it's a sad ending I think there are a lot of things to cry about in Umbrellas of Sherbrooke that are that are more than the romance and um, like you I feel 
I feel for Catherine Deneuve. She is like a child and she's totally heartbroken, genuinely heartbroken. And you just really, your heart goes out to her. But as you say, there's the war, there's the mother's shop, there's the aunt who's dying. There are all these other things going on. And um, yeah, a broken heart isn't, isn't the worst of uh, things to cry about in life. I, I don't I love that you that. mentioned at all, Walter. I think, feel like I've been off piece a little bit. There, but. No, 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 that's this spot on. I, and I think, um, I, I love that you mentioned that the idea of a happy ending. And, you know, when I first watched it, I didn't think it was. I was like, I expected them to go, you know, into the back room and, and re rekindle their love and sorry about it, you know, invisible husband Roland. And yeah, I'm sorry about it, you rich guy. We're going to live in squalor. We're going to, you know, this is going to, we're going to run away together. Um, that's the romantic ending. That's the ending that I really wanted when I was in college and when I was younger, before I met my wife. And, um, you know, and the first bloom of love when I first met my wife is very much like the first third of this film. I felt like I could float. I felt like I knew this person forever. I would do anything. I would die for this person. And now, you know, after being married 23 years, I think, um, and I don't remember, I'm not good at those dates, but it's been a long time uh, with two kids. Um, it's, our love is different. It's as strong as passionate, but different. And it mm -hmm. isn't about these floating down the street in, in Montmartre, you know, it's not that mm -hmm. anymore, um, but it is substantial, it's something. It's based on this, the, the, this sort of long tide of experience. There's a really wonderful thing that I heard once at, at a friend's wedding where the uh, person performing the wedding said something like, you know, you're not committing to marry one person today, you're committing to marry all of the hundreds of people that this person is going to be during the course mm -hmm. of your life together. And yeah. you know, at the beginning of the film, they're just one person to each other. And at the end of it, they're, they've committed to the work of it. You know, the, what, 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 what Kierkegaard would call the labor of love, right? Um, and it's, it's what's, I think it's a happy ending. And sustain uh, real life, you know, as much as we love Keats and uh, all that, but high romance can survive real life. And I don't think it's a, it's a sad thing. Um, it's always a sad thing when, there's a change or something dies away but I think real love the solid love that actually gets people through their days old people holding hands in the park I don't think there's anything nicer in the world that people who've been together for 40 years you know who've been together for decades I think that kind of love to me is uh, much more what I what I want to have than, or what I hope to have and as my life goes on and you and yet at the same time, what speaks to much, so much to an artist's heart, I think, or a romantic's heart, are these memories that we hold of those high emotions. And I think that there, there are three instances in the film in which a character breaks the fourth wall and looks directly at the camera. And they're each related to memory. The, you know, the aunt says, remember me. The, 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 the first time Catherine Deneuve says, I'll never forget you. And then the third time is when she's, she's be, being married. Um, and she looks directly at the camera, but the role of memory, and especially the role of remembering passionate moments from a place, some dis place distant in the future is the very foundation of romanticism uh, mm -hmm. as a movement in poetry. And, you know, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, sort of this uh, tragedy of experience as being sort of the foundational element of an artist's life, uh, you know, a, 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 as an Irish person, not me, you, um, you know, you're, so much of your culture, as I know it, is seeped in this, you know, Yairaith, the, the, this feeling of nostalgia for a time that maybe didn't exist, this real passionate re reflection of the past. Yeah, absolutely. Irish people are at heart uh, very romantic people. <laughs> There's a reason why we're a nation of poets. Um, I think a lot of that comes from the fact that we're a historically very traumatized people. Uh, for centuries, we've had all kinds of big, difficult issues. We've had a lot of loss, pain, emigration. We lost like two thirds of our people in the famine, uh, either to, to starvation or to emigration. Um, we had obviously the troubles after that and so on. Uh, there's a lot of pain in, in Irish history and for some reason that makes people introspective and romantic. It, we romanticise the past even though the past is where we suffered. And I think the same is true when you think of young love, you know, you think of the first time that you fell in love and that floating feeling that you describe. But 
also how awful was it too though uh, the first heartbreak and how much just I think back to my younger days and um, you know boyfriends that I had that I barely remember now but that I really loved when I was say like you know 15 and uh, how I thought my heart would break and it actually the amount of headspace that it takes up is just really overwhelming um, I think in the umbrellas of Cherbourg um, Guy and Genevieve are both really romantic people we know that in the first third because of how they speak to each other and because of the story that's told um, between them I don't think that they could have survived I don't think that relationship would have survived I think um, now as an adult when I look back on it um, when I watch it again I think he really needed someone like Madeline we know from the very beginning every time Madeline's introduced pretty much we're told that she's sensible she's practical uh, she's kind I think he needed someone like that um, I think if he'd come back from the war and, when, and she came to the gas station and they went into the back room and they ran off together with Francois to live uh, simply, as she says in the first part of the film, I think that would have ended in tears really quickly. I don't think that's what either of them needed. Um, and what they needed was what they eventually got, which was the, uh, the solidity of the people that they, that they married in the end. I... I... I hear echoes now of Jacques Demy's life with Agnes Varda. They had a, a sort of a well-publicized separation for a few years in the 80s in which, although they were separated, they, they lived across from each other on the same street. You know, they lived in opposite, you know, facing houses. They were always very close. And, you know, Varda, towards the end of her life, um, talked very warmly about that period. It's like, we, we needed to be separate at that time, but we were um, also sort of destined for each other, a very sort of romantic story for Demy as well. Um, and they, they had two children together, even though he was, you know, Bi bisexual and and I think that, that there were some you know um, complications with that especially in his public life but uh for for that filmmaker and, and a Douglas Sirk for instance you know or a Rock Hudson starring so many Sirk's films making a movie like this about the comfort and the and the joy the possibility for joy in this sort of relationship for me is extraordinarily poignant yeah I uh, yes I fully agree with you on that and actually um to bring back, because when I rewatched this last night and I hadn't seen it in a couple of years, I really was thinking about Brief Encounter a lot. And um, I, I had this very similar feeling of a Brief Encounter. A uh, Brief Encounter being written by Noel Coward, who was of course a gay man at a time when it was really, really illegal to be gay um, and where it was actually dangerous to live as a gay man. Um, but a man who loved nothing more than a cozy home, pipe and slippers. He liked to he liked to cook. He liked nice objects. He liked homemaking. I think this home that uh, the two principal characters in Brief Encounter have would have been very attractive to him, which is why for me, actually, I think Brief Encounter is, is a happy ending. <laughs> I know it's not a popular uh, opinion, but I really think it is, uh, knowing what I know about Noel Coward and seeing it from that perspective. And I think it is really interesting to look at Umbrellas of Cherbourg from that perspective too, um, that ideal of a, of a romantic relationship. I, I love the ending of Brief Encounter so much. Spoiler alert, but the movie's 60 years old. You've had time to watch it. Um, that that I, I love when the husband says, who, who we think is oblivious through the whole thing. That he has no idea, right? Uh, you know, is distracted. He's always doing his crossword puzzles and stuff. And I love the last line of the film is him saying, uh, thank you for coming back to me. You know, he's given her this space and this time and then she's chosen him. Um, that kills me. Yeah, and I think that's the, beautiful. Yeah. There's a reason why that's the most heartbreaking line because the real love story is between him and her. It's not about Alec at all. It's Alec is just a stand in um, for Fred. It's really about Fred and her and their marriage in that house. I think that's beautiful. Yeah, I, I've always felt like, you know, for all of the expansive land, 70 millimeter landscapes that David Lean ever painted, he never painted a greater emotional landscape than he did with Brief Encounter. That movie is titanic. Gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. Tr Great. truly so. Um, we, we should open it up to questions if people have them. Uh, you know, Daria, you can comb through a little bit. Last thing, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about before we, we go there is, you know, as you're shooting movies, you know, you did your first on 16 millimeter and doing these things. How often do you think about the costuming and the art direction and the production design of a film like Umbrellas of Cherbourg 
as a means of storytelling in your own films of, you know, how do I use these environments, these costumes to tell the tale? Well, I mean, for me, and um, I, I studied film, I went to film school, but then I worked in theater for a long time. So uh, costume and sets are really important to me. I don't think you can underestimate the, um, I mean, film, obviously it's a visual medium. This is a good third of your storytelling is in the, in what we see on the screen. What, what is behind the character? What's the character wearing? What are the colors? And what are those things giving us? Uh, and I think Jacques Demy in particular has beautiful design in, in all of his films. I think it's very important. For The uh, Devil's Story, which is my film that you refer to, um, that was intentionally, because it was found footage, I was evoking something like Salesmen. Uh, I was thinking of uh, those kind of uh, cinema verite documentaries of the early 60s. And we went to quite a lot of, uh, we, there's a lot of detail <laughs> in that, that uh, it really stands up to the texture of that time. And um, I think that's important. It's important to me. And I learned that in theater. Uh, you can't get away with just good enough. It has to be right. A couple of weeks ago, I was uh, talking about Spirit of the Beehive with um, with another director, and he uh, talked about how all movies, all art aspires to be music, um, which I thought was a fascinating thought and a fascinating idea. How, how does that play into your thinking when we talk about Umbrellas of Cherbourg and what ma many first time viewers probably, myself included, would ask about it to say, this is not exactly a musical, not the way that I understand it. It's not exactly an operetta. It's not exactly an opera either, because there aren't, for me, those soaring arias and those big moments, the, you know, the women and the horned helmets or whatever it is that I think of when I think of opera. Um, so what is, did Jacques Demy and Michelle Legrand aspiring towards by shooting it this way? I understand completely what is meant by that, that um, music is the art form that we all aspire to as artists. I think it is the one art form that, does it all there in one. It, what art is doing for me, um, the artist is attempting to communicate a feeling, an emotion, something that you can't articulate. That, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to communicate that. And once you've done that, your job is done. Um, in film, we have a lot of different devices that we use to try to create the full picture in order to do that. But music does it with one fell swoop. It's so elegant. If you hear uh, the theme from Umbrellas of Cherbourg, you you already know your heart's going to break. We get that instantly. It's such a neat mode of communication. So I understand that completely. I think from um, for Jacques Demy, uh, I think a, a very large part in it was in commenting on uh, the American musical. It was about acknowledging that uh, and that effect on pop culture and on his own understanding of pop culture. Um, I think he's almost certainly understood the power of music to communicate emotion because this film does it so beautifully. Um, I think the reason that he chose that mode is because, and it's a very interesting thing to do, the American musicals preceding this, particularly things like um, Singing in the Rain or uh, An American in Paris, um, they, they tend to, they, and this is not an across the board statement, but largely they tend to focus on, as I've said earlier, escapism, uh, gloss, sheen, like Hollywood does to this day, uh, more often than not, focus on the beautiful, the elevated, and taking, taking us away from real life, real pain, real drudgery, real existence. Whereas French cinema at that time was attempting to be really, um, to really dig into human, being human in, into what that meant in France at that time. And I think it's the juxtaposition of the two, two things that makes the film so interesting. I think what's so lovely for me when I watch it and, and consider some of these issues about, you know, why this form and, and music is that if we, we look at our own lives as a song with, with a chorus that repeats, you know, in, in the film, there's these rituals that mark, that echo, that denote, and are shot the same way, these passages uh, in, in from one state to another state. 
you know, if you will, and, and, and how we use ritual in our lives and what's been missing for us so much. And we always talk about there's no time in quarantine. There's no time doesn't exist anymore. It's because I think to a large extent, we've lost ritual, um, these things that we do on a day-to-day basis, but a year-to-year basis or life-to-life basis. We can't even attend funerals for loved ones anymore. We have nothing to mark the moments of our lives anymore. And, you know, the psychic disruption of that, I think we'll feel for decades, generations. Yeah, I absolutely agree. All right, Daria, do we have questions? Let's talk about the color first, kind of like the elephant in the room, right? Um, Someone observed that like in the different parts of the movie, Genevieve was wearing like different colors. So say like at first it was more like passionate and juicy, like oranges, yellows, and then as she's waiting, it becomes more like muted pastel blues. Another observation was actually um, in the chat about the differences between the colors of her dress versus her mother's dress. Like her mom would always be wearing like a more prominent version of the color and she would be more muted. Was that in reference to her mom being a fully blooming flower and Jimmy being a blossom? So, so talk to us more about color. <laughs> I think the question answered its own question to an extent but I noticed um, I think I've always noticed that there's a point in the film uh, and I think it's pretty much the last time that we see uh, Genevieve and her mum in the apartment over the shop and they both suddenly have costumes that literally match the wallpaper so um, do you remember that piece where uh, Genevieve is wearing like the blue uh, patterned dress and then it's just before she tries on the veil uh, just before the wedding sequence and it's almost like they're turning into the house I think that's a really interesting and obviously a very conscious decision because they would have had to it wasn't just that they got something the same color it's literally the same pattern as the wallpaper uh, and I think that's a really uh, interesting thing for him to have done so I think the color is really uh, consciously managed and very overt in this film there's no sense in which it's attempting to be subtle and I think um, the person who asked that question has touched on a lot of that and what it represents uh, I don't know if you have anything more to add to that Walter that, that I think it's fascinating your phrasing there that you said they're turning into the house I'm thinking of just this last year there's so many really superlative horror films about houses acting as metaphors like um, his house uh, on on Netflix uh, now really, really extraordinary film about immigrants into uh, the UK uh, that has, you know, a witch to follow them from, from their country of origin into the house. Uh, and the witch essentially reminds them of all of the things that they had to do to get to a safe place, quote unquote. Um, Relic, the uh, really great uh, a film about, you know, a woman who, is, who has become demented, who wanders away from her house and causing her daughter and her granddaughter to come find them. And the house becomes you know, and it's the K and the peeling wallpaper. And, you know, and then I'm reminded of the short stories like the, the yellow wallpaper or even novels like Jane Eyre, you know, where, where the house becomes, you know, a construct of the subconscious, a construct of these things. And, and it, how does that play in with Umbrellas of Shared Board? How have these people internalized their business, um, internalized their home and have used those places and those occupations as expressions, outward expressions of their personality? Uh, and, and again, I'm looking at sort of this critique of capitalism in a way where it is madness. It is madness in the United States to equate the value of your life with the thing that you do and the amount of money that you make. You don't have health insurance in the United States. You can't, you, you, you can't survive if you don't have a job where you're making somebody money. It is insanity. It's the cruelest, most amoral system. And it's working really well. You know, we're finally getting to the place where we're creating trillionaires. So capitalism is doing fine, but not for 99% of the people in it. You know, we're, so here is Umbrellas of Sherbrooke sort of glancing off of this in a way to say as much as I admire the United States. And then the United States is, is giving us the American dream in the form of owning an, uh, a, you know, a petrol station, a gas station. That's survival. That's survival. Mm. And, 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 um, yeah, I was really stricken by that turn of phrase, Ashlyn. The, the idea that they are becoming their houses 
my God. But also the transition to to the wedding veil, right? And the idea that, you know, you're going through this thing. It's like a very, very Jalo sort of setup where you're going through this mannequin store and all these mannequins. And then there's a person and she turns around. Yeah. And she becomes, she is another thing that's on display in a way. And there's a, you know, what, what's our relationship to Catherine Deneuve? What, what has it always been? And I love how immediately after this, she follows this film with uh, Repulsion. Um, yes. In, in which she's the subject of the male gaze to the point that it drives her insane and she starts to kill people. Um, yes. The best, yeah. best movie. But um, yeah, but but here's Catherine Deneuve uh, being presented as this sort of object, even well, by she, you, right? She's a version of the, um, of the pearl necklace that the mother... The mother sells the pearl necklace and it's Catherine Deneuve herself, the character Genevieve, who says, why don't you sell your necklace? And the mother says, I can't, don't you know what it represents? And she doesn't finish the sentence, but we know what it represents. In the film, it represents her child, her daughter, uh, who the same man comes to buy, in a sense, um, as the film goes on. So I think there is a sense that she's kind of hollowed out a little bit at that point when she is puts the veil on, she's like one of those mannequins. But I think it works out okay for her, actually. Yeah. I'm, I hope, I hope, I'm an optimist. Yeah, she seems to be doing okay. Um, but you know, that, 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 that makes me wonder too, because I know that Demi was a huge fan of Max Ophuls. If, if, if the necklace isn't a reference to the earrings of, Ma of um, Madame Day um, in some way, you know, or, 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 or even Guy de Maupassant, the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, writer with this idea of um, objects having this sort of to to totemic uh, value, um, which would be in keeping, I think, with the rest of the film, this idea that we keep these mementos mori of our of our past lives and loves and obsessions. You know, I'm surrounded by action figures right now, so I know of which I speak. Um, all right, other questions? Time there was actually uh, a comment that I wanted to bring up. Carter said, when we were talking about uh, the transition from umbrellas to washing machines, that you know, umbrellas keep things dry and washing machines make everything wet. Yeah, that was a really great observation. Yeah, that's good one, yeah. Yeah, and, and the thing about domesticity that washing machines represent too is sort of a mechanized, uh, you know, socially sort of crafted, man manufactured idea of domesticity that I think that it is. And in that moment when he discovers that he's at his very lowest, you know, he visits oh. a prostitute, one of the kindest um, depictions of a sex worker, I think. You know, the French were really good at that as well. You know, not the least of which, you know, Catherine de Deneuve's film, Object of Desire. To our larger point, I think ultimately everyone's happy, especially Guy. You know, he, he, when he sees her, there's this moment of real like sadness, but the domesticity that he's found is. He needed that. He was going down a really bad road, I think, headed down a dark place, and Madeleine saved him. I think he needed her at that time. But uh, just to go back momentarily to the washing machines, which is a really interesting point, and that was a beautiful way that uh, person praised it. Um, there is something as well of, uh, like with Michael and Laundries in Ireland, the metaphorical washing away of sins. Um, when you have a washing machine, you're constantly every day trying to make new again, this constant never ending uh, cycle of, of cleansing. I think that's, um, that's why they were chosen as well, just, that's what life is just this we're in the cycle, cycle. spinning around right yeah. the spin cycle of uh, of filth and redemption yes yeah. <laughs> let's do one more question i think we sure. have, uh, a moment so uh it was from jean um basically i would love for you guys to extrapolate on this thought that like pragmatism is taken differently so like we think of French we think of a very romantic culture right but how the movie ends is very pragmatic while Americans are considered pragmatic but their perfect ending would have been you know a happy ending of the couple ending together so what's the role of pragmatism in different film movements and different cultures between French and American? I think that is a really interesting question and it's funny because I see it kind of the opposite way around. I think Americans are very romantic. Um, I think American culture is very romantic and always very idealistic. Um, whereas I think the French are really quite brutally down to earth sometimes. Uh, and I think in a 
I was thinking about this in relation to umbrellas of Cherbourg and the issues that it touches on politically and socially and um, the fact that a uh, guy came home from the war and he says several times, I can live on my pension. Uh, I can live on my pension. Um, whereas in, uh, in America, we have so many issues. I say we, I'm not American, uh, but I love America and I spent a lot of time there. There are a lot of issues with veterans after the war, mental health issues. They're, um, forgive me for not saying as the only non-American in the room, uh, not that well taken care of socially, whereas in France, they are take it well taken care of socially. So I think the strange dichotomy is that um, America is an idealistic nation. And because of that, some things fall to the wayside because life is never going to be ideal. But American culture is always reaching for that ideal. Whereas in France, there's an acknowledgement of a uh, failure of vulnerability, human fragility uh, on every level, which means that there's more protection. So it ends up being a more romantic place, if you know what I mean. I think it's a really interesting thing to think about. Yeah, and I think, for, the, for, for, you know, for the longest time, the United States, for large parts of the other, uh, rest of the world, was aspirational. I could get there. I could go there. I know that was true for my parents, you know, coming here from uh, mainland China and through Taiwan to the United States. It was like, this is the place where my kids can grow up and be something. This is a place where we can be free from all of these things that we've, uh, you know, in a sad country like China is a very sad, almost Russian sad uh, sort of country. Uh, we can get away from that. America is aspirational. Here you can do things for yourself. And that's the foundation for all of our lack of social networks is to say, you know, we equate lack of success with the moral failing. You know, there's something wrong with you. You're not truly an American enough if you're poor. You're not working hard enough, you're not doing right, you're not smart enough. There's something that's not right about you, we're aspirational. So I think that that, that point's interesting because as Americans, we live here and we're like, this is bad, this is not okay. I wish I was in Paris right now, ah, Paris, you know? Or, or, or you know, I, I'm thinking of, any, of Indiana Jones, I guess, when he was like, ah, Venice. We, ro we tend to romanticize these old world countries. We, 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 we look across the pond and say, oh man, it's just so beautiful there. They have history, they actually have a history that, that's, you know, perhaps not completely steeped in white supremacy. There, there's something really beautiful about being somewhere else. Um, yeah, you know, but, but that's interesting to have that sort of perspective. So we are at 12.30, uh, uh, 6.30 your time. Um, Ashlyn, I promise you one hour hard, hard stop. So we must stop there. Uh, I wanna thank again, our, our tremendous hosts, Daria and Andrew and the Denver Public Library. Um, a big shout out, by the way, to Daria who edits all of these videos that are archived. It's a huge undertaking. It's a lot of work. She, she really works hard at them and uploads them to the YouTube channel for uh, the Denver Library, which is also not monetized. So really consider, if you will, a donation to the Friends of the Denver Public Library. Uh, they really do great stuff. Uh, let's, not, uh, let, let's not slack in our um, duty to support social services like the library. And uh, a tremendous thanks to the great Ashlyn Clark, uh, brilliant scholar and filmmaker. Uh, she has a short film on Hulu right now about an eye exam that just freaks me right the F out. I'm sorry, I cannot, you know, all the close-ups of the eyes, please don't do, ever do that again, Ashlyn. But um, uh, that's on Hulu now. Devil's Doorway, I think is also on Hulu or sh it's streaming. Uh, yeah, it's on Hulu. I'm trying, it's on, in America, I'm trying to remember where it is. It's yeah, on yeah. Hulu and uh, I think it's on Prime as well. If you've not seen Devil's Doorway, you guys, I, I don't, I don't ask anybody to come on here. Uh, you know, not just anybody. Uh, Devil's Doorway is so good. It's so good. And I'm very cynical about movie, horror movies, especially. I love them so much. I expect them to be better. Um, and it just really blew me away. So please watch it. Uh, it's, it's tremendous because it has, it's more than just really, really scary, which it really is. Uh, it's amazing performances, Lalo Roddy, and it is amazing, amazing. And it has a lot to say and it's eternally current, unfortunately. So please catch, catch up with that. Thank I you guess. so much, Drew. Yeah. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you and thank you to everybody at the uh, Denver Public Library for having me and thanks for everyone for listening in and your brilliant questions. It's been so fun. Thank you. <laughs>